please start. Okay, so I, I'm really I'm really appreciate the uh, Jungkook team for uh, inviting me to um, make a presentation for my recent work on the dark photo documentary in the middle of Imasu model. Can you hear me well? Hello, can you hear me well? Yeah, yeah, yes, I can hear you. Okay, and, and this work was done in the collaboration with Chitomi Yanagita and Norimi Yokozaki, which were published in these two papers here. Okay, so I hope uh, I can, so I'm gonna do, oh, sorry. Um, okay, so I'm gonna do my best to finish my talk within a given time, uh, not so, so that I don't disturb your afternoon. And uh, so here, here's the outline of the today's talk. Uh, so the first place I'm gonna briefly remind you of what's the minimum mass model. And then I move on to the discussion for uh, how we could have uh, order 10 KD document documentary in the minimum minimum mass model. And then next I will, I'll, I will move on to another discussion for how we could have put a 3 KD document documentary in the minimum mass model. And then finally, I will conclude this talk by making some summary of what I have talked and um, and and raising some questions that I think uh, that I think are challenging my work and this model. Honestly, okay. So what is so? Let me bring, briefly remind you of again the minimal mass model. Um, it's nothing but the extension of a certain model. Uh, which extends the which, which extends the standard model gauge group by including um, a U1 gauge symmetry whose whose corresponding conserved charge is the baryon number minus lepton number, and the model has the particle contents, which includes standard model particles and uh, free right hand neutrinos and a single complex scale. Okay, and so what and, and then the next question is what's so great about this model? Um, this model, uh, as, as I'm gonna show later, uh, this right hand neutrino will gonna couple to the, this complex scalar. Uh, and, and after condensation of this complex scalar, uh, the right hand neutrino will gonna get the Majorana mass stuff. And also, this right hand neutrinos also have a coupling to the uh, standard model uh, left and doublet and, and Higgs doublet. And so, given these two interactions, um, based on the system mechanism, you can address the uh, you can you can answer the you can probably you can address the question about the origin of tiny actin, a tiny mass for the actin neutrinos okay and also um, the uh, thanks to the presence of this Majorana mass term uh, the lepton asymmetry uh, the lepton uh, the uh, when right hand neutrino decays uh, lepton number violation can become possible and also the interference between the tree level uh, right hand neutrino diagram and the lepton level uh, diagram uh, will enable you to have a CP violation. So when the right hand neutrino decay is out of equilibrium decay, then uh, satisfying the free Zakharov condition, and you can uh, produce uh, this right hand out of the equilibrium decay of right hand neutrino, uh, enable the model to produce the prime with lepton asymmetry, which will gonna be later time converted into the Baryon asymmetry due to the, uh, thanks to the Schiffa lepton induced vacuum transition. So these two, so these are, uh, the, so the fact that in some, the minimal PMS model due to presence of these particles based on this gauge symmetry uh, can address these two issues. Uh, this is, this is the one of the advantage of this, thinking about this model. Then uh, you may ask, uh, then there arises a natural question, which is nothing but, uh, is there any interesting dark matter candidate in the minimal PMS model? Okay, um, you can, first one may ask, what about the scalar field here? Uh, can this be an interesting dark matter candidate? But for that, uh, in order to avoid overclosing the universe, probably you need to set the mass of the scalar field um, to be some intermediate uh, energy scale, much below the cutoff, UV cutoff. But then you encounter the hierarchy problem. So the question is how to justify an intermediate mass scale for phi which is much below the UV cutoff of the theory. So you encounter a hierarchy problem. Or you can say, uh, what about the lightest right-handed neutrino among three right-handed neutrino? Okay, and then uh, the, the same thing is, the same thing happens, like you need to, uh, you'd better the set the mass of the lightest right-handed neutrino, so intermediate scale. Uh, but in that case, uh, the question is how to justify the separation in the mass scales for this free right hand neutrino. In other words, why, why you have such a large separation for magnitude of Yukawa couplings? So these are the fundamental questions uh, then that, that, that one needs to address 
if one needs to, if one is aiming to take this file and, and the right and Gino is a dark matter candidate. So in light of this, uh, we ask, uh, we ask the following question. Then how about taking gauge boson of B minus L symmetry as a dark matter candidate? Okay, and uh, we, while we're asking this question, uh, we're making uh, some interesting observation, following observations. The first uh, system mechanism in leptogenesis, they require, of course, breaking of mineral cell symmetry here because you want to have a massive right hand neutrino. Then uh, that automatically uh, makes this gauge boson massive. Okay, so you don't have to introduce the mass term for the dark matter candidate in your model by hand. Okay, so that is already guaranteed by these two mechanisms for successful these two mechanisms. Uh, secondly, um, uh, given the null observation of dark matter or null detection of dark matter today, uh, there's no doubt that if there is non-gravitational interaction, the dark matter does, then then must be very weak. And um, within this model, if we take A prime as a dark matter candidate, then the economical description for the weak non-gravitational interaction becomes possible because uh, you what what you need to do is just just assume a small gauge coupling. Okay, for having successful weak non-gravitational interaction for dark matter. Okay, so with these two being said, um, um, the gauge coupling is very small, can be very small, and also is required to be very small due to uh, dark matter uh, non dark matter's nature, and also for successful season leptogenesis, you'd better have a very high scale uh, beam mass breaking scale, but because the mass of the uh, mass of gauge boson of beam mass cell symmetry is given by the product of these two you can have uh, without doing nothing you can have a you can have an intermediate mass scale for the a prime dark matter candidate so without violating any uh, successful mechanism of system mechanism uh, without any violating without disturbing the success of the system mechanism and leptogenesis okay you can avoid having a uh, too heavy dark matter mass so these are the interesting observations that i have excuse so, me yeah, yeah. Uh, before you uh, going on, I mean, could you show the previous slide? Previous slide, yeah, sure. Yeah, in the second option, you consider uh, scalar phi as a possible dark matter candidate. Yeah. But uh, what is the motivation to introduce phi from the beginning in your model? Phi from the beginning. Uh, I'm not. I'm not aiming to introduce this, but uh, I'm just trying to. Uh, but but this phi must be introduced in order to make uh, right-handed neutrino massive by a condensation of scale activity phi. So this, this phi, as well as I'm gonna explain uh, later, this phi but is, the, yeah. So phi, phi breaks uh, B minus, B minus L. L, right? Yeah, sure. That's then right. then how, how do you think it can make a dark matter candy? How do I think it can, like, of course, uh, the, if you, so I, I'm just trying to ask naive questions, starting as a starting point. And, uh -huh. and, and one may ask, like, what about phi as a dark matter candidate? But then, uh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. But then the, you can have a, you, because you have a fluctuation around the global minimum, you can have a phi particle here, okay? The phi part, then the question is, one can ask such a question, what about phi particle as a dark matter candidate? Then of course, the later you need to do this very specific analysis for, for achieving correct dark matter relative abundance. Like you need to tune the couplings and you need to tune the, you need to, you need to select the mass for the scalar field. But what I'm saying is in that case, probably you need to assume some intermediate energy, intermediate mass scale or scale of field, dark matter, which is much smaller than the UV cutoff. But in that case, you, you encounter a hard problem. Because of that problem, I'm saying the phi, it depends on point of view, but from my point of view, phi cannot be a good dark matter candidate, right? Because of a hard problem. That's what I'm saying here. Okay. Then how about Higgs? 125 GV Higgs? Higgs as a, as a dark matter candidate? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm talking about fine tuning problem. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, the Higgs has a yeah, yeah, That's a yeah, of course Higgs Higgs has a hard problem, and we don't have any solution. Of course, uh, people some people say supersymmetric models can solve hard problem, or uh, or or other like technicolor. You have many many basic models which can address in their own way the hard problem, but uh, but without assuming any, without giving any priority to any models, yeah, any 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 solutions, hard problem remains unsolved. Then the question is then then, then I but. Uh, but I think uh, one cannot, when one should not ignore the hierarchy problem. When what I'm saying is, one try to build a model, DSM model. If he is determined to introduce a scalar field, okay, then he need to be care about uh, the hierarchy problem. If scalar mass is very small, uh, very small comparing to the UV cutoff, 
okay? And that is required if phi is a dark mirror candidate. That's what I'm saying. Then you cannot avoid the Hark problem. If phi, is, if phi is allowed to be very heavy, then it's okay. It's at least the Hark problem is not worse than the Higgs case. But, because, but if phi, is, phi wants to be a dark mirror candidate, then its mass must be intermediate mass scale, much smaller than the Rick cutoff. Then in that case, Hark problem arises again. You have another second Hark problem in, in, in this model. So I want to avoid such an issue here. I want to I want to I want to make a scalar field as heavy as possible, but then it's, of course still I have a hard problem. But it's not worse than the case where phi is a dark mirror candidate. That's what I'm saying. Do I, do I answer your question? Or? Uh, yes. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So if you have any questions, we can discuss more. Uh, and okay. So. So these are the interesting observations that I'm making uh, when I take the A prime as a dark mirror candidate. So, okay, so based on this observation, let me just try to take A prime as a dark mirror candidate in this model. And then uh, let me move into the specification for the B minus L charges. Um, uh, for, for scalar field, I impose minus two, and for right angle neutrino, I impose plus one. And for quark and leptons, I impose a plus one third and minus one is a B minus L charge here, okay? And with the charges, uh, as, as you can easily see that within the cell model, these two anomalies, like, you know, B minus cell, uh, SU2, SU2, B minus cell, uh, U1 hypercharge, U1 hypercharge, U1 hypercharge, that is already zero. So that anomaly already uh, vanished. Okay, so you don't have to care about this anomaly. But once you are determined to promote B minus cell symmetry as at two, two decay symmetry level, then you, then there arises two more anomalies, which should be confirmed to uh, vanish. Uh, those are nothing but the B minus L uh, self anomaly and B minus L gravitation anomaly. And within the standard model, as you know very well, uh, these two anomalies does not finish, do not finish, okay? But when, once you include this right-hand neutrino with this charge assignment, then you will gonna see that this contributes to this uh, presence of right-hand neutrino uh, contributes to these anomalies, making the total uh, anomaly, quadrant, uh, anomaly uh, can vanish. So that's the one of the advantage of uh, you know the introducing this right hand neutrino in terms of promoting uh, when you are determined to promote the beam cell symmetry to the gauge symmetry level. Um, probably you can ask uh, why 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 do I focus on this kind of charge assignment? Like you can you can assign other charge assignment to achieve these anomalies. Yes, of course. Um, there, like for example, you, you can you can impose uh, plus four plus four minus five, and then you can also have a uh, you know the anomaly. You can also have a cancellation of these two anomalies, but uh, for simplicity, uh, for our work, uh, let us focus on this charge assignment here. Then, because of this charge assignment, you can have a uh, Yukawa, okay? Yukawa coupling between the scalar and right-hand neutrino here, okay? And uh, and, after, uh, and and later after condensation, and, and the scalar field potential is given here. So uh, after later, uh, when the condensation of scalar field happens, um, that will gonna impose the. Uh, they're really gonna make this uh, final neutrinos uh, massive and very heavy, depending on the path. Um, as a dark matter candidate, um, we know that the, we know that the A, sorry? Can I ask you a question? Yeah, 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 sure. Please go back to the slide, yeah. So here you don't consider coleman weinberg mechanism of phi. You ready the correction? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. you just simply consider the mass term of phi. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So we, yeah, of course, uh, we you, you can you can consider such a correction, relative correction to the scalar potential. But uh, we, uh, yeah, for our, for like our aim is to show the presence of B minus M over where you can have a dark button dark matter. So uh, we wanna remain, uh, we wanna remain at this level in our when you when you write down the potential. But uh, yeah, you, of course, you can go through the detailed analysis by by including the irradiated correction to the to the scalar potential. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, taking a prime as a, I, I'm very sorry because um, I, I I have a lot of slides, so I hope I can finish uh, my talk uh, for uh, within the given time. So that's why I'm. Uh, you may feel I, I'm hurrying up, but uh, I want to finish my talk for uh, with the, within a given time, so as not to disturb your afternoon. So uh, please understand uh, my 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 uh, my very fast speech. So I have a so having a prime as a dark matter candidate in this model. Then uh, you know that, as you can see here, the sonomal fermions are charged under this gauge symmetry. So uh, it's probable that we have a prime decay to fermion, sonomal fermion, and anti-fermion, sonomal anti-fermion here. 
And then because A prime is dark matter candidate in our mind, uh, we need to suppress the disease decay so that the A prime uh, lifetime should be at least greater than the age of universe. And that gives us this relation between the um, A prime mass and the B minus of breaking scale. Okay. Also, you have a you have a the for decaying dark matter case, you have a lifetime constraints. Okay. You have lifetime constraints from, from, from X-ray and gamma ray diffuse photon spectral data. Okay. And that gives it, uh, and that tells us the for the for the decaying dark matter who, who can have a final state radiation. Um, its lifetime should be at least greater than 10 to 24 seconds, okay? And that constraint gives us this relation between MA prime and BMLC breaking scale, okay? Uh, for the BMLC breaking scale of our interest, which is smaller than Planck mass, um, we conclude that uh, if we consider, if we focus our MA prime to be smaller than one MeB, okay? If we restrict, if we restrict our MA prime to be smaller than one MeB, then we can, we can, we can safely avoid the uh, A prime's decay to plus and minus because it, this is kinematically suppressed. Um, also, uh, as we're going to see, uh, gauge coupling is very tiny. So, uh, so for our case, A prime decay to three photons that is suppressed also because of very tiny gauge coupling, and also uh, our another assumption for very tiny uh, kin mixing between gauge coupling, this A prime and the hypercharged gauge boson is not involved, which I'm going to uh, explain later. Uh, so you can convert this expression of this constraint coming from the lifetime of A prime to this form by requiring lifetime should be greater than the age of the universe. And which and 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 here uh, you can see that the gauge coupling of B mass and symmetry should be smaller than like these values. And okay, so for KV scale dark matter, KV scale A prime dark matter, you can see that the G the gauge coupling of B minus cell symmetry is ridiculously small, okay? But we accept it here. So um, KV scale dark matter, A prime dark matter is now, so now we just specified our uh, dark matter candidates mass regime. It's smaller than one MeV, okay? So it's, it, it means uh, it's, it's KV scale or sub KV scale. And as a particle who has a such a mass regime, um, it's most probably a warm dark matter, okay? Because it produces a uh, very long uh, burst remains. So it should be subject to the warm dark matter mass constraints coming from the Lyman of forest observation. Um, on the other hand, we know that for, for a thermal dark matter that once belonged to the thermal thermal bed, the maximum possible mass could be uh, at most order 100 G or order 100 E, okay? Um, so combining these two facts, uh, we come to know that our KV scale dark matter, because it's KV scale greater than this order 100 EV, uh, it cannot, it cannot be, uh, it cannot once live in the sun of our best, okay? Otherwise, we're going to have uh, too much of, uh, too much abundance of dark matter today. So we need to separate, we need to introduce a separate dark sector system, okay? Which is cooler than this sun of sector in the, in light of the, uh, dark matter mass regime that we consider here, KV A prime dark matter. So then the question is, how could we establish such a system? How could we such, how could we uh, create such a dark sector system uh, whose temperature is smaller than this thermal temperature? So for this purpose, um, we consider the scenario where uh, the visible sector of the model uh, is composed of a standard model particle and free right-handed neutrino. And the invisible sector is made up of scalar field and A prime, the gauge boson, dark gauge boson. And because we want to have a, because our dark matter, A prime dark matter mass regime requires a dark, a dark sector system cooler than the standard model sector, a standard model system, it is, it becomes necessary for us to suppress all the couplings serving as a pole. Otherwise, you know, our dark sector will gonna be easily thermalized by thermal particles, thermal thermal bed, so that uh, so that we cannot avoid having too much abundance of A prime dark matter. So to this end, we assume a negligibly small kinetic mixing between uh, A prime dark matter and 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 thermal hypercharged gauge field, and also we need uh, we assume a suppressed operator, the Higgs polar operator, to avoid the thermalization of uh, of dark sector. 
And we're going to take the scalar field as a model particle for the dark secret system. So this means we're going to think about a way to create the dark sector uh, uh, by producing phi first, OK? And then A prime, A prime will going to be created, produced later uh, due to phi's decay or phi's annihilation. Um, then the question is, because phi is taken to be as a model particle, starting point of dark sector, uh, which should, whose temperature should be smaller than standard normal temperature, we need to find a way to produce phi non-thermally, okay? Um, to answer this question, uh, we re I, let me remind you of the fact that uh, it suffices to have only two right-handed neutrino for system mechanism and leptogenesis. So, and in light of that, we, in this model we now work, we attribute system mechanism and leptogenesis to uh, first two right-handed neutrino, let's say N1 and N2. Then you're left with uh, N3, okay? And we take N3, third one, as, uh, as a right-handed neutrino responsible for the phi production, non-thermal phi production. Um, as you know very well, the phi has uh, two interaction in the model, gauge interaction and um, Yukawa interaction here. And gauge interaction, as you know, is very, very small. So it's very hard to use gauge interaction to non-thermally produce phi. Okay, so then uh, this, this Yukawa operator uh, can be used for non-thermally produced phi if this uh, cu coupled right-handed neutrino, which I'll call here N3, uh, is living in the cinema of our best, okay? Then, uh, then using this operator, uh, one can imagine these three possible ways of producing a uh, phi particle here, okay, using this operator. Um, and um, as you can see, the second and third diagram, they have two different kinds of coupling. You're here you have a Yukawa, and here you have another Yukawa, different kind of Yukawa. And here you have a Cortic, and here you have a Yukawa. So these two diagrams have a two different couplings. Of course, um, all of these diagrams uh, do make contribution to the phi production. And in principle, one, if one needs to, if one is ambitious, one needs to go through the uh, whole analysis of uh, taking into account all these three uh, diagrams contribution for the phi production. But um, because our purpose is uh, just, to, our, our original purpose is to show the presence of the model, the Imanasin model, where you can have an A prime dark matter. Uh, we we simplify uh, our, we want to simplify our, our analysis. And um, for simplicity of our analysis, we focus on the case where only the first diagram uh, makes dominant contribution to the phi production, okay? That's because for the first diagram, you, you only have a first, uh, you only have a single kind of, a, a single kind of a coupling, okay? So it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's good to use first one rather than second and third one, okay, for analysis. Uh, and for our purpose, um, first, uh, to suppress this diagram's contribution to the phi production, we assume, we assume suppress, suppression for this Yukawa, okay, where N is the N3. So by suppressing this, uh, N3 is coupling to Higgs doublet, lepton doublet, uh, this third diagram contribution becomes suppressed. And also, uh, in order to suppress this diagram's contribution to phi production comparing to this one, we further assume, uh, we further assume this relation between Yukawa and Cortic interaction. This is coming from comparison, uh, comparison of the interaction rate corresponding to this diagram and this diagram. By requiring interaction rate corresponding to this diagram is much greater than that of this, we get eventually this uh, relation. So once that means once Yukawa, this U, once this Yukawa is much greater than, once Yukawa satisfies this relation, where lambda is a scalar field quartic interaction, and also once you assume the suppression for this operator, then, uh, then that gives you uh, a way to simplify your analysis. So, that, so that's what we do. But we agree that in principle, one can, one can uh, take into account all of these three diagrams contribution for phi, phi production, okay, uh, which can be a uh, later study, future study, okay. So we focus on the K possibility where this is the main phi production channel, okay. Um, 
And um, if the amount of cell breaking scale is smaller than the reheating temperature, then as you know very well, at the, at the end of inflation, the universe is very cold and reheating will gonna reheat the temperature, reheat, reheat the universe again. So if the amount of cell breaking scale is smaller than reheating temperature, then after reheating, uh, the, during the reheating, the symmetry will gonna be restored, okay, which was once broken at the end of inflation. So in order to avoid such a complicated situation, uh, we assume that the amount of cell breaking scale is greater than reheating temperature, okay? And then there's no symmetry restoration after reheating. So this gives us kind of a lower bound for the scale MS given reheating temperature and the quartic insertion coupling strain. Um, and in order to, and this means the scalar field was sitting at the global minimum during, during reheating, okay? That means during reheating, the scalar field mass must be greater than Hubble expansion rate in order to make the scalar field sit at the global minimum. And this requirement, which is coming from, of course, this, gives us another lower bound for the scale MS in terms of reheating temperature. And, and let me call from here on these two conditions, 1A and 2A respectively, okay? And also let me call this condition, which is simplifying our analysis by suppressing this diagram, uh, condition 3A. So from, from now on, um, I'm gonna focus on the parameter space, which satisfy these, these three conditions, 1A, 2A, 3A. Um, next, in order for the phi production to be mainly attributed to um, N3 instead of N1, N2, uh, we assume the following two cases. The first case is, so first case is for thermal epigenesis and second case is for the non-thermal epigenesis. The, for the first case, we, uh, we assume the MN, so let's say the first, the, let's say these two right-handed neutrinos responsible for the season leptogenesis, let's call these right-handed neutrino N1 and N2. And here, let's say the N bar is responsible for the phi production, okay? And then by having MN bar, uh, but, sorry, uh, by having MN, uh, for, uh, sorry, uh, by having MN bar and MN bar two smaller than reheating temperature, uh, you can have N, both of N, N, N and N2 in standard model thermal bath. Then this guy as a particle in standard model thermal bath, it's out of equilibrium decay can, uh, can cause the thermal epigenesis. And also by, by assuming MN, MN2 is smaller than MN, uh, we can have phi production mainly coming from N scaring instead of N2 scaring. Uh, and also uh, by, and also, of course, a thermal epigenesis requires reading temperature greater, greater than 10 to 9 GV. Um, and the maximal bearing asymmetry is a, fu is a function of uh, nut active neutrino mass scale and the right-hand neutrino mass. Uh, that gives us the lower bound for the right-hand neutrinos for a successful epigenesis, that is 10 to 9 GV. So if we assume this hierarchy, then we can have a thermal epigenesis and, and phi production mainly coming from the scaring of N. Um, second, if we assume, if we have uh, N1 and N2 heavier than reheating temperature, and then these guys, N1 and N2, does not belong to a standard model thermal bath. Then the out of equilibrium, out of equilibrium decay of these guys will gonna, uh, will gonna enable the non-thermal epigenesis. Uh, on the other hand, by having uh, N, N smaller than, MN smaller than reheating temperature, we can, we can still have a N in standard model thermal best, and it can scatter each other to produce phi non thermal okay? So this, if this is satisfied, then we can have a non thermal epigenesis and, 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 and we can have a non thermal production of phi from N, T channel N scaring. So in either case, uh, we only need to care about uh, this one, N, N scaring concerning phi production. So we don't have to think about the N1 and N2 scaring in terms of phi production. Okay, so, and furthermore, uh, in order to suppress the possible phi decay to two N3, two, two Ns, uh, we, in order to kinematically suppress the decay of the phi to right hand neutrino, we assume the, uh, we assume the mass of the right hand neutrino is greater than the scalar field mass here. Okay, with these assumptions in mind, now, uh, the right-hand neutrino, right-hand neutrino, T-channel scaring, which I show here, this one, T-channel and 
right now in Genius Scale, we're going to give you, uh, we're going to produce scalar field phi non thermally if the Yukawa coupling is small enough. Okay, now the, depending on the, now, okay, so now phi is produced non thermally from uh, right hand internal scaling. Now, depending on the strength of the quartic interaction of scalar field phi, uh, there arise two different evolutions for dark cycle system. So the first case is together with uh, A prime, uh, phi can form dark thermal beds. And, which you, and, and I'll call this scenario with dark thermal beds. The second scenario that is possible is the dark sector history is, is simply described by just free streaming, uh, free streaming phi and free streaming A prime. And I call this scenario without dark thermal bed. Uh, so let me first uh, go into the explanation for the without dark thermal beds. Okay. So when phi is no, when, when, non when phi is non-thermally produced from right hand neutrino scaling, uh, it's a relativistic particle because we assume uh, its mass is smaller than right hand neutrino mass, which is comparable to the thermal temperature. And this relativistic phi can decay to produce a pair of A primes, okay? If the decay rate multiplied by M over T is greater than Hubble expansion rate, okay? And let's say the scale factor A star uh, is correspo corresponding to the time when left hand side becomes comparable to Hubble expansion rate, okay? And then when, if the exact toxic temperature at that time, when this happens is greater than the scalar mass, okay? That means scalar particle is still relativistic, can be still relativistic particle inside the thermal beds, okay? Then, then it can avoid Boltzmann suppression. Then the dark thermal beds can indeed uh, form uh, and can be composed of scalar field and A prime together, okay? And, and, and to have such a formation of dark thermal beds made up of phi and A prime, we impose, uh, we impose this condition, which is nothing but this one here. And this condition is written in terms of scalar field mass and the quality interaction. Okay, C is a toxic temperature, uh, the ratio of toxic temperature to the thermal temperature. And we'll call this condition 1B. And this is nothing but the dark, this is condition guarantees the formation of dark thermal deaths of phi and A prime. Okay. Um, so we have discussed about the A prime cave scale dark matter, uh, but, uh, but our dark sector, because our dark sector system history is quite different from usual thermal dark matter uh, history, thermal history, uh, the, we cannot directly use the Lyman alpha forest constraints on the uh, thermal warm dark matter mass constraint. And, um, and in order to, uh, check whether our scenario can be consistent with the uh, Lyman alpha forest observation. Uh, let me focus, let me briefly, uh, uh, let me briefly remind you, uh, let me briefly uh, make some explanation for the, uh, how you can get the um, mass constraint of our, one do our A prime dark matter consistent with the Lyman alpha forest observation. So uh, for that, uh, let me try to introduce the quantity called warmness. Okay. So here, if you look at this expression here, then you can see that, uh, you can see here, F is nothing but the momentum space distribution of a dark matter candidate. Then the sigma tilde here, sigma, sigma tilde squared here, this is, this quantity is representing the variance of momentum space distribution of a dark matter. Okay, when, and, and when you know the dark matter temperature and, and its mass, combined with this uh, standard deviation of momentum space distribution, uh, one can define the um, one can define this quantity called warmness. Okay, uh, for detail, you may look at uh, you may refer to this paper, uh, Kamada and Yamagi. And the point, the key point is this quantity, which is called warmness, characterizes the sound speed, and there and and also and the sound speed, as you know, determines gene scale, beyond which the growth of the matter fluctuation becomes possible. So that means the warmness, uh, warmness characterizes just, just warmness characterizes this gene scale. Okay, then it means uh, it means uh, if you compute the warmness parameter for the A prime dark matter candidate, and when 
warmness for the A prime is close to the warmness for the usual thermal warm dark matter, it is expected that the resultant matter power spectrum with A prime is similar to that of warm dark matter. So that you can avoid inconsistency with the uh, observed matter power spectrum and Lyman alpha forest observation. Okay, so that means uh, equating warmness parameter for A prime dark matter to the usual thermal warm dark matter uh, gives you the mass constraint for A prime, which can be consistent with the Lyman alpha forest observation. Okay, so if you look at this expression, then, then that is the result of equating these two warmness. And this means once you know, so, so we know the warm dark matter mass constraint. So, so we know the warm dark matter mass constraint, and also we know the we know we know what is the warm dark matter temperature today. Okay, so we know these two parameters, and what this expression tells you is in your model, if you know uh, the first momentum space distribution of your dark matter candidate, warm dark matter candidate, and also if you know the today's warm dark matter temperature, then you can compute the lower bound of your warm dark matter candidate consistent with the line alpha forest observation. So in our model, we can compute the today's, uh, today's temperature of A prime. And also uh, because for, 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 for this scenario with dark thermal bath, because we know that A prime is blowing to the thermal bath, we know that the, its momentum space distribution will gonna follow thermal distribution, whose sigma tilde is 3.6. Okay, with these informations, one can, uh, we can obtain the uh, lower bound uh, of A prime, dark, the dark potent dark matter allowed by Lyman alpha forest observation. Okay, we do that, then we get the 20 keV, it's a safe lower bound, okay, given the warm dark matter mass constraint of five, five to six keV. And there are many, many debate on, on this. What, what, is, what is really the lower bound of warm dark matter mass? Really depends on what, what Lyman alpha forest observation data that you use. Some people say 10 keV, 10 keV, 7 keV. Or even some, some people say the conservative lower bound is 2 kV. So it's, there's a ambiguity for this. But we take 5 to 6 kV as a thermal warm dark matter mass constraint. And that, that tells us 20 kV is a safe lower bound for A prime dark matter consistent with Lyman alpha forest observation. Okay. So now uh, you can go through the, the straightforward uh, the relic bonds checking. Um, and um, because our non our phi is uh, non thermally produced, um, you can based on this this expression to estimate its co-moving number density, uh, and also notice that the gauge coupling is very tiny in our model. So the the the, the only longitudinal mode of A prime can join the dark thermal mass, okay? Because longitudinal mode of A prime coupling to phi is independent of the gauge coupling. So given that fact, we know that the number density of A prime is equal to number density of a scalar field. Okay, then in this way, we can compute the co-moving number density, co-moving number density of dark potent dark matter. Okay, so here's a result of our analysis, uh, which is given as the plots of uh, scalar quality interaction versus scalar mass here. And each of the plot has a, is based on selective uh, dark bottom dark matter mass and reheating temperature and right hand in the neutrino mass here. Okay. Um, this first this is a yellow shaded region is based on the condition that I, 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 I already told you that I always keep in mind this, these three conditions 1A, 2A, 3A, and especially for with dark thermal bath scenario, I need one more condition, 1B. So using this four condition, um, I can obtain this yellow shaded region as a consistent primary space. And also above the blue line, uh, the area, this the area above blue line, we're gonna make uh, A prime live longer than the age of universe. And also the area above the green line uh, makes A prime dark matter relic bonus smaller than or equal to uh, current dark matter relic bonus. That means, uh, for example, like this region, okay, satisfying all these con condition constraints can make A prime dark matter today. Uh, and, 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 and if you want to, and, and, and each of the plot is based, uh, is based on increase of M A prime, increase of reheating temperature, increase of M A, the right hand neutrino mass. So you can, by comparing these plots, you can look at uh, how the parameter space behave when you make a variation on the one of the these parameters. 
So I just showed uh, with dark form belt, you can have a dark photon dark matter in minimal dimension model. Uh, next, uh, let me move on to the scenario without dark thermal bath, okay? Uh, and again, uh, when there's no dark thermal bath, we can imagine the scenario where a phi is just non thermally produced, then phi free streams, and phi becomes non relativistic, and phi decays when decay rate becomes comparable to Hubble, and A, A primes are produced, then A primes start free stream, okay? And let's say the A and R is a scale factor, a uh, scale factor corresponding to the time when the phi becomes non relativistic. And let's say AFS is a uh, scale factor corresponding to the time when A prime uh, starts its first stream. Okay? And then in order to realize this scenario, we have to impose this condition where the uh, temperature at A and R should be greater than temperature at AFS. Uh, once this relation is satisfied, this scenario can be realized. Uh, furthermore, uh, when this kind of thing happens, there should not be formation of dark thermal bath due to the scalar quartic interaction. Uh, and, and T evaluated a lambda is nothing but the temperature uh, at which the dark thermal bath due to scalar quartic interaction can form. If this temperature is smaller than TAFS, then uh, there's no chance for the scalar field to form dark thermal bath because already at this time, there's no scalar field. So there's no scalar field. So once we impose this condition, once we have the parameter space satisfy this condition, uh, we can really have this kind of scenario, just five, five, produ five produced and five free stream and five decay and a free stream. Uh, let me skip this, uh, let me skip this uh, explanation for this uh, detailed explanation. But the point is uh, via this way, uh, one can compute the temperature of thermal thermal best at A and R and temperature at AFS, which are given here, okay? And given this uh, temperature at AFS, one can also read the scale factor corresponding to the time when the free streaming of A prime starts, which is given in terms of lambda and quartic interaction and scalar field max here, okay? Uh, and also, uh, because uh, our A prime dark matter with the, in without dark thermal bed scenario, is coming from decay of non relativistic scalar particles, we can approximate its initial momentum to be a scalar field mass divided by two. So we know this, we know its initial momentum and we know uh, AFS. So we can compute today's, today's A prime temperature. And it means that we know this. And also uh, literatures, uh, in the literatures, there is a well-known formula for, well-known expression for the momentum space distribution for the for particle coming from the non relativistic scalar decay. And for that case, it turns out the sigma tilde is one. So given one and given A prime state temperature, uh, we, we can compute the uh, lower bound of uh, A prime mass consistent with the Lyman alpha forest observation. Okay. Uh, one can also go through the same straightforward analysis for the relic bonus. Then in the end, uh, here's a result for our analysis. Uh, uh, which is given as a four plots of uh, quartic interaction versus uh, scalar field mass here. Okay, this again, the illustrated region is a result of the conditions one one a two a three a and uh, and and this condition. And uh, and the region below the uh, for the region below the red dotted line, uh, the parameter space makes it sure that the a prime dark matter is consistent with the Lyman alpha forest observation. And above blue line, uh, A prime lifetime is greater than age of universe. Above green line, uh, the dark matter relic abundance is matched to, uh, uh, sorry, A prime relic abundance is equal to or smaller than the dark matter relic abundance. So for example, like the parameter space like below red line, above these two green and blue line within the yellow shade region, this is the consistent parameter space where you can have uh, dark photo dark matter based on the scenario I just mentioned, without dark thermal mass, okay? And they, by comparing these plots, you can see how the parameter space move uh, when you change the one of the these parameters, okay? Okay, so let me move on to the general anti-anomaly issue relating to this work. Um, as you know very well, uh, there has been a report from the general anti-collaboration about uh, that they observe uh, an excess in the electron recoil data by xenon T detector, okay? 
and there has been a lot of interpretation for for a source of excess in the electron recoil data and um, we focus on among many possibilities uh, we focus on the possibility where dark button dark matter is the source of xenon anomaly it can be one of the candidates that may explain this anomaly through absorption analogous to the photoelectric effect. Uh, a feed of good quality for the excess in the electron recoil data hints for, interestingly, if you want to use dark photo dark matter, dark to dark matter to explain this anomaly, then its mass must lie in uh, 2 to 3 kV mass regime. And also the the feeding for the excess tells you the kinetic mixing between vector, that vector dark matter with the hypercharged gauge version of the model should be as small as 10 to minus 15. So this, especially this is very interesting. Why? A prime is like given this mass regime, if you think about this seriously, A prime with this mass regime, two to three kV, is, this is most probably a sort of one dark matter, right? And MA, just that mean, but However, this mass regime is too small to be a thermal kind because, as I said, the usual Lyman alpha forest observation gives you uh, the like you know five or six or ten kV as a lower bound for thermal one dark matter. Okay, so this is this is too small to be a thermal one dark matter. Okay, then this may signal a non-thermally originated A prime dark matter. And and again. Interestingly, the, the kinetic mixing in 10 to the minus 15, this is very interesting, very supportive, uh, uh, defending the uh, non thermally originated uh, A prime on dark matter, because this kinetic mixing is most dangerous coupling that can thermalize A prime dark matter. Okay, so suppressing this is kind of very supportive to in, in our thinking about non thermally originated A prime dark matter. Okay, so we mo so motivated by this interesting observation. We ask again the same question: Can the Riemann assembly model uh, produce such a dark button dark matter? Now with two to three kV mass regime, okay. But so far we have seen that at least for the um, neutrino scattering induced uh, dark button dark matter in Riemann assembly model, we can we, we have seen that it's not possible because the mass regime is like twenty kV, thirty kV, or the ten kV, okay. So we cannot rely on the uh, so far discussed mechanism to produce a dark photon dark matter in minimal phenomenal model to produce uh, a prime dark matter with this mass regime. Then the question is another way is there an, uh, is there on um, is there another way to produce two to three kV dark photon dark matter in minimal model? Again, uh, it's a dark, because A prime is a dark matter candidate, its lifetime should be, of course, greater than the age of the universe. Once again, that gives us this constraint. And again, you can see that two, for two to three K mass regime, the gauge coupling is ridiculously small. Okay, but it's okay. We accept it phenomenologically. And also, uh, using the existing symmetries of the model, you can const you can write down the scalar uh, scalar potential. Okay, that we have uh, here, the Higgs polar. But uh, phenomenologically. Because now we have the good reason to think about non thermally originated dark photon dark matter. We have, of course, theoretically, there's no way to suppress this operator here. But uh, phenomenologically, because we need a non thermally originated dark photon dark matter, okay, we have a reason to suppress this operator. Okay. If you ask a theoretical reason, and I don't have, but uh, we are phenomenologically motivated to suppress this operator to avoid thermalization of dark sector. Because otherwise, um, you know, the Higgs Higgs scaring will going to immediately thermalize phi, and phi thermalize will immediately the A prime. So A prime cannot be a non thermal origin in dark matter. So we suppress this operator now and more. Okay, now to have a to have a, this two to three kV mass regime dark button dark matter explains an anomaly. We consider the possibility where there is a positive Hubble induced mass for the scalar field during the inflation, okay? With Hubble expansion rate assumed to be greater than scalar mass. In minimal BMS model, in any case, we need a scalar field, okay? So our purpose is, our idea is, okay, let's try to use unavoidable presence of this scalar field to make A prime dark matter with two to three K mass, okay? Then what can you do? Then we consider the scalar field 
who has a who obtained a positive Hubble induced mass during inflation, probably which can be you know induced by the gravitational interaction between the scalar field and the important field. And let's say the Hubble expansion rate is during the inflation is greater than scalar field mass. Then, then, then that enables us to write, modify the scalar field potential during inflation uh, like this form. Okay? Then the Hubble expansion rate uh, dominated over the negative, uh, negative, uh, negative, negative scalar mass square. Uh, and that gives rise to this simple form of scalar potential during inflation. What does it mean? It means if this question is positive, then during, then during inflation, instead of Mexican head potential, we're going to have a parabolic potential for the scalar field potential during, only during inflation. But then it means during inflation, the phi field sits on the origin of the field space during inflation. Okay. But after inflation ends, of course, the scalar field, we're going to get back to, the, get, we're going to get back to its original form. So, the field value at the after inflation ends, corresponding to the field value corresponding to the global minima, changes from zero. Zero was the global minima of the scalar potential during inflation. But after inflation ends, because scalar field, scalar field potential will get back to its original form, now the global minimum go back to its original value, which is bad divided by square two. So, so this means at the end of inflation, there arises a non-vanishing phi field displacement with respect to the scalar field uh, global minimum, the scalar field potential global minimum of the original potential. And let me call this initial displacement at the end of inflation phi initial, okay? That is given by the, the B minus L breaking scale, okay? And um, at, the end of, at the end of inflation, of course, the Hubble expansion rate is greater than uh, scalar field mass, okay? Then, the, then this means scalar field will gonna just stay at the, in the origin of field space because it was in the origin of the space during the inflation. And scalar field, because of this relation, Hubble expansion rate is greater than scalar field mass. Uh, the scalar field will, uh, will feel the huge uh, friction. So it does not move at the end of inflation. Only when, and later time the universe cools down and Hubble, Hubble expansion rate decreases, and when Hubble expansion rate becomes comparable to the scalar mass, let's say the corresponding time is A oscillation. And then when this happens, the phi field starts its quaint oscillation with energy density M square phi square. And if you try to solve the, if, if you try to solve the equation of motion for the scalar field, given this Hubble friction, and then you will come to know that the scalar field uh, in terms of scalar factor, a scale as uh, a to the minus three half, meaning that, and you have a phi square here. That means uh, energy density of a scalar field scale as a, uh, this is proportional, inversely proportional to the A cubed. What does it mean? It means uh, coherently oscillating scalar behave like just, just like matter, okay? Because of this uh, scaling behavior of energy density. So it's really behave like motionless, pressureless matter. So we then, uh, then interesting observation can be made here. If A prime can be coming from the decay of this coherently oscillating scalar field, then because this is almost motionless particle, we know that the A prime's momentum space distribution will very, very narrow. A narrow width of the momentum space distribution for A prime is expected, okay? What does it mean? It means if you remind yourself of uh, this uh, discussion problem of first, it means a sigma tilde is very, very small so that you can have very low allowed mass for the dark for dark matter consistent with the Lyman of Apollo's observation. Yeah, that motivates us to think about this scenario. Okay. Then, uh, then let's say now decay happens at AFS. AFS means a first string. Then uh, in, order to, in order to compute this time, what you need to do is just compare the decay rate to the Hubble expansion rate to get, to get the temperature at which the decay happens. And that is given by here in terms of lambda and uh, M5 here, okay? And also uh, using, using this product is equal to 10 to the minus, 10 to the minus 13 GeV, uh, you get the scale factor, okay? At which free string starts. Um, because our A prime darkener now is coming from the coherently oscillating scalar field, decay, um, 
a single phi produces a pair of a prime, meaning that uh, the number density for a prime is twice that of scalar field. Okay, and also uh, because we know the energy density form for scalar field by dividing this rho phi divided by scalar field mass, we can obtain the number density of scalar field. Yeah. Okay. And then when you estimate this the view at the oscillation time, then you get a co-moving number density for dark matter. Okay. Then by matching this to the you know, nowadays known dark matter co-moving number density, you get a constraints on the breaking scale, luminosity of breaking scale and, and MA prime and the scalar field mass. Yeah. And I want to emphasize here that um, because Scalar field, when it is currently oscillating, it moves, it behaves like a matter. It's almost motionless. So when A prime is coming from the decay of the scalar field here, the initial momentum is really very close to the scalar field mass divided by two. So the free string length computation in this case is very, very precise comparing to other cases. For other cases, there's a subtlety for, for this initial momentum. But for this case, uh, it's, uh, the, the accuracy is much better. Um, unfortunately, uh, because we don't know the momentum space distribution function for the A prime, uh, when A prime is coming from decay of currently oscillating scalar, okay, there's no literature. If there's a momentum space distribution function form, then we can compute we can compute this sigma tilde here. But because we don't have a momentum space distribution function of A prime coming from currently oscillating scalar, uh, we cannot actually. Although I said or, although I said here the uh, sorry, um, although I said the um, although I said the momentum space distribution function of a prime will be characterized by the very narrow width, uh, I don't know how small it is. Okay, so there's no way to for us to compute uh, to compute the sigma tilde here. That means uh, we cannot uh, we cannot use this mapping to get the lower bound of a prime dark matter mass. Instead, instead, uh, because as I said, for this scenario, uh, first string length is uh, is more accurate than our case. Uh, let me rely on the first string length to 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 confirm the consistency with the line of the forest observation. Okay, and people say when usually first string length when is or point uh, one mega per sec. Uh, it can be consistent with alignment of a forest observation. Okay, so uh, so here is a result of analysis, uh, and I show you a plot of the coupling strength of uh, the scalar quartz interaction coupling strength lambda uh, versus scalar field mass here. Within this green gray, green shaded region, uh, the dark photon dark matter contribution to the delta effective is smaller than the BBN constraints. Um, and, uh, and, and each of dotted lines shows you the collection of the, the group of the points on this parameter space, which enable A prime uh, first string lengths uh, amount to the specified values here. Okay, for example, if you look at these uh, points on this uh, magenta dotted line, then you will gonna have uh, first string lengths one mega per sec, traveled by the dark photon dark matter. And the red solid line shows you the collection of points on this parameter space, which make dark button dark matter uh, satisfied today's dark matter link abundance, okay? And um, especially the free string lengths from 0.3 to 0.5 megaparsec is an interesting regime because 0.3 is known to be, uh, above 0.3 is known that um, the warm dark matter can, uh, can address the uh, missing sunlight problem. And also if the free string length is smaller than 0.5 megaparsec, and some literature say uh, you can avoid inconsistency with uh, metaphor spectrum by avoiding too much suppression. So it's, especially this uh, free string length is an interesting regime. And you can see that our scalar field should be as, as high, as, like, as heavy as like 10 to 5, 15 GB. And the quartz interaction is better like 10 to minus four or three. Okay, so let me conclude my talk. Uh, the BMLS model is one of the extension of a solar model, which is very compelling uh, due to its capability to, ad to address the uh, two issues, tiny neutrino, active neutrino mass and leptogen and, and baryonic, baryonic symmetry via CISO mechanism and leptogenesis respectively. Uh, we discussed two different ways of producing KV scale dark, dark matter. 
for all 10K deductible documenter, it is traced back to the um, neutrino scaring, right hand neutrino scaring is normal from a breath. For two to three kV dark photon dark matter, it can be originated from the co coherently oscillating scalar field. Okay. And um, after this kind of work has been done, uh, have been done, I have, uh, I have asked to myself the following question seriously. As I emphasized uh, so far, the required gauge coupling is ridiculously small, like 10 to the minus 18 or 19. So if this scenario, these scenarios, in other words, if we really have a dark photon dark matter in the B minus L model, then it seems that these scenarios require very tiny gauge coupling, okay? Then I ask to myself, why do we have such a small gauge coupling? What, the, what, what UV physics enable us to have a, such a tiny gauge coupling? This is some, I think this is kind of a challenging question to my model, to our model. And also like what can suppress the polar interactions? Like Higgs polar, like what UV physics can, can help you uh, justify suppression for the polar interaction, Higgs polar interaction, for example. These kind of questions, I think are challenging questions which challenge uh, the work that I, have, that I have done and explained so far. Okay, so this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any question, uh, please ask me and yeah, we can discuss more. Okay, thank you for nice talk. Uh, so, question? Um, yeah, I think I finished my talk exactly within an hour. And this is, <laughs> yeah, 4 p.m. Hello, uh, may I ask a question? Yeah, sure, yes. Um, I have a question about uh, the the the, the Hubble in this mass. Maybe I I missed something, but uh, mm -hmm. um, you said oh, that yeah, during inflation, the U one yeah. cell can be restored. It's unbroken, and it's broken up after the inflation, right? Um, well, what I'm wondering is that uh, mm -hmm. if um, that's cosmic right. string, so, cosmic string forms. In... Oh, that, yeah, that's right. That's right. Because yeah, that, right, right. For for the for the second scenario, uh, we're gonna have a B massive breaking after reheating. That's right. And then you're asking, uh, in that case, what about the cosmic string formation? Yes. 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 Uh, that's a very good question. But uh, the scaling, the, the non-scaling solution for the axion mm -hmm. is, is for uh, is for uh, significant coupling. In other words, like our gauge coupling is very tiny. So we, we are thinking that the usual scaling solution cannot be applied to our case, unless there is some lattice calculation for the very tiny, very, very tiny gauge, very, very tiny coupling. Okay, scaling solution for very, very tiny coupling. If there is, then we can, we can based on that scaling solution, we can estimate the dark photon dark matter coming from the, uh, coming from the cosmic string. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then we can we can confirm whether whether we're gonna have too much a prime dark matter or not coming from cosmic stream. That, mm -hmm. That's your question, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. yeah. But, but because of the absence of any 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 uh, any computation for the scaling solution based on very tiny gate tiny coupling, uh, so far uh, as of now we cannot conclude anything about that. Or if or if there is a problem for the Rayleigh bonus, then we can we can assume we have a we have a negative Hubble in this mass, okay? Yeah. During inflation. And then mm -hmm. we can, you can tune this, uh, of course this is tuning, but uh, at least this is a resolution. This can be a resolution, I think. You can tune this uh, question CI, negative CI, in such a way that the, during inflation, the phi sits at, 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 at a uh, different point than this B minus cell breaking scale. Uh, yeah. yeah then, then, then the separation between Email cell breaking scale and and the and the position at which scale sits in during inflation, that that deviation will gonna give you the uh, initial amplitude, right? Yes, and, yes. And, you, and of course you can turn it to 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 produce the right abundance of dark matter, dark matter, dark matter. So that can be a kind of an alternative solution to your solution to your question. I see. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. Thanks for your question. Great question. Okay, another question? Uh, I'm, yeah, I, I feel very sorry for my very, very uh, fast 
uh, presentation. Uh, I, I was kind of a feeling burdened to finish my talk within a given time. So, uh, so I think it's, it was very, maybe it's very hard for audience to, yeah, to digest and then, um, uh, yeah. I mean, any, any question can be addressed, please ask me. And, and that can be improving uh, our understanding for this model or, yeah. I hope, uh, yeah, there can be questions and we can discuss more. Um, I think uh, there is no more question. Uh, so, uh, okay, then uh, let's thank the speaker again. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Mm.